So there's this rumour going around, you may have heard it, that we humans are somehow separate from the plants, animals, trees and water around us. Separate and superior. Well, we're starting a new series to help put that rumour to rest. We're going to get into the weeds, quite literally at times, of this popular misconception by exploring the species that live among and alongside us in our urban areas. Often seen, yet unseen, unsung or even maligned, they're a reminder that we are not alone on this planet, even in our cities. And in inviting you to see what has always been there through new eyes, there might even be a chance to slow down for a moment and to really see parts of the natural world we've never noticed before. This is Living Planet. I'm Charlie Shield. And here's DW's Tamsin Walker, who's been putting this idea to the test in a Berlin park. As someone who loves being among trees, by the sea, in the hills or under the brooding skies of the flatlands of my local countryside, living in cities for the entirety of my adult life has often felt at odds with a yearning for calm. A yearning that's too deeply buried to be clearly understandable or accessible. I think of it now as an instinct, because time without number, when a hurting heart or a troubled mind has moved me to spend time in the urban nature on my doorstep, I've come home soothed. Being out there where the summer wind whispers and autumnal rain pounds is like being with faithful friends of old, like being part of something more than the rush of urban life. And in this age of climate crisis, that feels essential. So I walk, the same route through the same Berlin Park every day. It's a far cry from the seemingly endless roll of hills in the part of England where I grew up. And there are no wild waves, no mountains, no lakes. It is quite simply a city park. And honestly, for a long time there was a part of me that was quietly noticing everything it was not. Until one day, a stranger unwittingly helped me to stop making comparisons and begin truly looking. I can trace the moment of the shift back to a spectacular late autumn afternoon when the sun was starting to drain from the sky but wasn't going down without a show. It infused the swan song coppers and yellows of the season with what felt like promise. Of what? I'm not entirely sure, maybe just life itself. And among the many who seemed to be admiring the display was a woman clearly captivated by the sight of a full-figured tree rising from the thick red carpet of its own discarded foliage. She stood, head tipped back in a pose of such wonder that I stopped to look up too. After a while, she turned to me and smiled. It was a moment of togetherness with a perfect stranger. An imperfect moment, as it turned out, because when I confessed, as much to myself as to her, that despite having passed the spot a thousand times or more, I'd never actually noticed the tree that held our gaze, I drew a palpable line between us. I don't remember what she said, but I do remember the look on her face. It asked me how I could have missed it, this giant mass of life and colour in front of us. And I've asked myself the same question many times since. In the intervening years, I've come to regard the tree as my favourite. Or sometimes just my tree, though of course I know it's not. I visit the streamside spot where it stands several times a week and spend a few moments there with no particular aim in mind. Sometimes I just sit beneath it and watch the water flow through the dapple of its shadows. Sometimes I stand and breathe beside it, touching its now familiar bark. On other occasions, I stare up at the shapes created by the tangled webs of its spindly yet copious branches, or at the empty spaces between them. And I often find myself wondering about all the other people who have stood or sat where I do, of the thoughts coaxed into existence by the quiet calm of its dense growth and the aches and pains of human life that it might have helped to heal. 
Over the years, I've come to notice how it responds to the seasons. The crocuses and nettles that grow comfortably at its base. The ivy that crawls shyly up its trunk. The softness of its needle-like leaves. The tiny fish and pond skaters that seem drawn to the shade it casts across the water. The giddy ducks and the lone heron that respectively splash and paddle under its watch. And the strange wooden stalagmite-like formations that line the stream's edge, separate from the tree, yet seemingly also a part of it. And it's an endless endeavour, all this noticing, because every time I go, something has changed, albeit just a little. One thing that hasn't changed, though, is that I still don't actually know what kind of tree it is, and that doesn't feel quite right, like I'm all take and no interest. I have tried to find out in the past, but confess my efforts have been a little half-hearted. As in, when a plant app offered me a bunch of possibilities, I didn't bother to find out which, if any, were accurate. But now I want to know, and I think I know where to look. Okay, so I've never actually looked for this before. But I do remember once hearing that Berlin has a register of trees. This looks like it could be something. I think that is it. Whoa, this lists 839,693 trees across the German capital. Don't know how I'm going to find mine among them. Except, what is it? Oh yes, it takes me to my local park. I'm half guessing here, but it must be about the sixth tree from where the stream curves under a bridge, which is here. That would mean that it is, hang on, drum roll, while I wait for it to load. It says that my tree is a cypress. So the app got that one right. A bald cypress. 23 meters tall. But what I really want to know is how old it is. Planted in 1950. 73. But before I get too carried away with this, I think I'd better make sure I'm definitely reading about the right tree. If I start at the bridge and just follow the line of the stream, count these trees. I get one, two, three, four. Oh, it's looking good. It's looking good. Five, six, and yes, it totally checks out. Bingo. So you're a bald cypress. You don't look, you don't look very bald. It feels like a big deal to know the name and something akin to the date of birth of the tree I audaciously call my own. It makes it visible through the lens of the human understanding of time and existence. And in a city like Berlin, where history is a living, breathing part of the here and now, that feels relevant. A silent witness to what once was, and how that has informed what now is. It occurs to me that though it was planted before the German capital was divided by a hard concrete border, the Cyprus spent 30 of its youngest years behind the Berlin Wall. It grew up, in other words, in communist East Germany. And it did so literally just a stone's throw from the official guest house, where those in the upper echelons of the GDR regime entertained high-ranking foreign guests such as Mikhail Gorbachev and Fidel Castro. Perhaps they too once stood beneath or besides what might then have been young branches still in the process of becoming what they are now. I will of course never know, but I can try and find out more about the tree itself. All right, so I'm going to go and meet a tree surgeon, Ben Spa, and see if he can tell me a little bit about the species. Uh, hi, how are you? Good. And here is the tree. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful tree. Yeah, it's, it's uh, breathtaking how, how beautiful the, the, the whole tree looks right now. It's a and cypress tree, right? I think yeah, that's why cypress, it's a cypress tree. exactly. So this tree usually grows in America. Central America to Northern America. Uh, it's typical for the Everglades because this particular tree uh, has an advantage. 
to grow in water. As you can see here on the ground, you see this little um, wooden... The nodules. Yes. I've been wondering about them. Exactly. And um, this is um, for breathing, actually. Roots need oxygen as well. Mm. And when you have water, it's harder to get the oxygen out. And there's less oxygen in uh, compared to normal soil. Okay. So trees, like mangrove trees, they need the, a special ability to, to grow in water. And the, the wood, is, it's like a sponge. It's like really open. Okay. So it helps the, the tree to breathe inside the water. These, so these nodules, basically, they're just like additional lungs for the trees. Or exactly. So the roots can grow deeper into water. I also find out that despite the water in which they're often rooted, bald cypress trees have very hard wood. That they're so named because as a deciduous conifer, they shed all their needle-like leaves in the autumn that they were introduced to Europe from America in the 1700s, that they have been associated with mourning and nicknamed Wood Eternal, and that while they can easily live a full millennia, there are some examples in the US state of North Carolina that have been dated to well over 2,000 years old. It's hard to fathom a living organism being that ancient, simply existing on its own terms, while centuries of human stories, lives and dramas have played out around it. I also, you know, this might sound a little bit out there, but I also really wonder about all the conversations a tree might have witnessed or all the secrets that it's heard, you know? Um, trees notice way, way, way more than we think they do. It's, uh, it's amazing how trees communicate. So there's a lot going on with trees that we don't actually understand quite yet. Um, and they know there's people passing them. Do you so, think so? I think because yeah. every, for my opinion, every um, every living thing on the planet needs to have a, a sense of what's around them. Otherwise, it's impossible to live. I love the idea that the tree has a sense of what surrounds it. And whether the bald cypress can feel my presence or not, I can certainly feel its. Not just when I'm sitting at the giant foot of its trunk where its nodules rise from its adopted home, but after I've moved on into other parts of my day. I've long taken the calm it instills in me into the rush of modern life, but now I do so knowing more about its origins, characteristics and innate intelligence. In short, with an insight into its story that makes it even more real. And that's humbling, humbling and relevant given that it's a disconnection from the natural world that allows us to act as if it's ours to damage as we see fit, as if we were not part of it, as if our own lives were not wholly dependent upon it. I doubt I'd recognize the woman who opened my eyes to this tree all those years ago, but I'm grateful to her for doing so. Because how can we be moved to care about or protect what we don't know or what we don't really see?